Sardinia today, there are still a few thousand stone buildings and towers standing, dating back to the second millennium before Christ, the Bronze Age. These monuments, made of cyclopic stones, are called nuragas, and the culture they are part of, the nuragic culture. A typical nuraga is situated in a panoramic spot and has the shape of a truncated conical tower. Come and join us in this movie and start to explore this fascinating prehistoric culture. This is the traditional dating as found, for example, in Wikipedia, putting the first new rocks around 1800 BC. Jacobe Manka, a leading archaeologist and editor of the journal Sardegna Antica, questions the classical dating. We are on the road visiting one of the early type of new rocks a so-called corridor nuraga. As the name implies, its main characteristic is that the inner part forms a corridor running through the monument. When we look at the huge stones, we see that they are very rough and uneven when compared to other nuragas, which are built from nicely worked pillow style stones. But the use of rough, irregular blocks is not a clear sign of archaic origin, because we also see similar stonework used in later add-ons. Early or archaic new rocks often have an irregular form and are also termed bastion new rocks. Even older are cyclopic walls, evolving from earlier megalithic stone settings. There is an example in close vicinity of the archaic Nuraghe Krastu. Jacobe puts these early beginnings into the third millennium before Christ and proposes the start of early Nuraghe edifications close to the year 2700 before Christ. This leads us to the typology of the Nuraks. We touched upon the archaic types made of junky, raw or just coarsely labored stone blocks. Many of them consist of corridors covered by huge flat stones or they already show a butt construction. Here, in the Nurage Marra, both types of construction can be seen next to each other. The outer form is most often irregular, but it can also be round. Some of the round types have evolved into towers with up to three floors, each one with a toloic chamber. A tolos is characterized by its false dome, created by the superposition of successively small rings of stones. The resulting structure resembles a beehive. Most of the nuraks contain such a tolos, and are therefore called Tolos Nurag. Some Nurags remained in that monotower state, such as the famous Nuraghe Santa Sabina or Sarbana in Silanus. Others, over time, have experienced the addition of further stonework 
surrounding the principal tower in different ways. Sometimes the additional construction leans onto the main tower as seen here at the well-retained Nurage Orolo. In other instances, the additional toloi are embedded into a more or less smoothed out wall construction. To the main tolos, up to five additional toloi are added in that way. The largest nuragas are huge fortresses with an outer ring wall, including more towers, so that the whole edifice includes more than 18 toloi. A typical nuragic site is first of all composed by a nurage. Often the nurage is not singular, but is part of a whole chain of towers covering a distance of a few kilometers, probably all once belonging to one Nuragic clan. A second important element is the grave of the type Tomba di Gigante, the giant grave. The name results from the myth that giants have been buried there. An obvious conclusion, looking at the tomb chamber, in most cases longer than five meters. Today they are thought to be collective tombs for one clan. Maybe only the bones are stored there after a precedent decarnation process. Sometimes the grave is quite close to the Nurage. Sometimes it's further away. Often it is not a single tomb, but a group of two or more in close vicinity. In some instances, even more tombs are aggregated into an area as at the site of Madau, close to Fonni. third element is the sacred pit, a well serving as a source of water, but probably also with a sanctuary function. Especially in Iron Age, a water cult seems to have developed with a strong impact in form of elaborated At the site of Romanzesu, there is a continuity from Bronze Age to the time of the Romans. Not all of the thousands of Nuraks still standing today are easily accessible by car. Many of them are deeply hidden in the back country. Small bumpy dirt roads, most of them missing in a normal GPS system, bring us deep into the Sardinian Macchia. Often we then have to walk through thorny bushland and sometimes we have to give up because closed gates, ferocious dogs, high fences and impenetrable thicket terminate our way. Of course, this has also some good aspects. It means that the interested researcher will find many undisturbed places and the quest for them 
has some real Indiana Jones flavor. Many neurogic sites are not excavated and the retreat of pastoral activities leads to an advance of vegetation. A lot of neurogas are today heavily covered with trees and bushes. It is obvious from the term giant grave that the neurogic remains are connected to myths and stories and the memories of the locals. There are even stories in some places where the elders account for findings of huge skulls and bones. Unfortunately, none of these finds are preserved or scientifically documented, neither in Sardinia or elsewhere. Nevertheless, there are many accounts, even recent ones, of giant people. On the internet, there are whole sites dedicated to collecting material about giants, archaeological finds and recent documents. There are reports from academic people, photos and even movies. However, there are also many counterfeits, frauds and moreover countless conspiracy theories of authorities having no interest at all in evidence about giants becoming public and therefore destroying or hiding any kind of means of evidence. The myths have been empowered by the fact that the Nuragic people have been able to handle huge stones, even far heavier than 10,000 kilograms. Jacobe guides us to the Nuraga Ponte, which features a gigantic architrave stone. After some measurements and calculations, we arrive at a conservative estimate of the weight of around 14 tons. Is it possible to lift a 14,000 kilogram megalithic stone? with a wooden lever and manpower? Applying the material data from oak wood into a beam equation, considering a 22 meter long lever, a thickness of the oak beam needs to be larger than 30 to 40 centimeter, depending on the cross-sectional shape. The weight of such a beam would be around 1,460 kilograms. This weight could be handled by 30 strong men. The force acting on the longer side of the beam by the weight of the wood alone is approximately 13 kilonewton, where half of it acts as a downward force at the end. Therefore, the additional downward force which has to be generated by adding weight to the lever end is 7.2 kilonewton, which corresponds to 734 kilogram and therefore around 13 men with an average weight of 60 kilogram each sitting close to the beam's end. The question how the stone could have been fixed to the beam is addressed by experiments from Albers and Viet. They show that an 80 mm wide strip of bull rawhide can be rolled into a cord with a diameter of 25 mm and a surprising strength 
of 11,000 Newton. At least 13 of these ropes would be needed to hold the stone. A couple more to be on the safe side. Despite the overwhelming presence of prehistoric remains in Sardinia, the neurotic culture is hardly present in the awareness even of interested persons. It is not recognized that the perfection of the Tolos probably happened here long before the Mycenaeans and the proto-Celtic people of Ireland constructed their toiloi. This is all the more a pity because the leftovers offer us a richly illustrated insight into a Bronze Age storybook of Mediterranean culture. Although we do not have written memories from Sardinia. It is nevertheless the age of the biblical Abraham and his descendants. The change from Bronze Age to Iron Age is in Sardinia and also in Palestine, dominated by events around the sea. stories of David the Hebrews fighting against the Philistines Pelisid, are a wonderful insight into the life of early Iron Age mankind. Some scholars propose a violent collapse of Bronze Age societies around the year 1200 BC. Among the decaying empires were the Hittite kingdom, Mitanni, Ugarit, and the Mycenaean civilization. Egypt was heavily attacked and involved in serious battles. The aggressors are called the Sea People and there are countless theories about their origins. However, it seems to be clear that there is no simple answer to the question of who they are or where they come from. But one of the Sea People parties is called Sherden or Shardana and is brought into connection with Sardinia. What is evident in archaeological terms is a dramatic change around the times of the Sea People's storm. Nuraks are partially destroyed and decapitated and their use is changed. Villages start to form around the Nuraga towers using stones from the primary Nuraga. Former Nuragas are used in some instances as new sacrificial sites containing an altar stone on top. The famous Bronzetti miniature statues are apparently from this era. What remains open is if the Nuragic tribes took part in the Sea People's Storm 
and have been called Shardana and experienced a change of mind and exchange of humans during that period or if the Shardana newly arrived to the island in the course of the events around 1200 BC and took over somehow. The following annotations would support the first hypothesis. Recent publications report about excavations in Palestine which uncover stone structures which show a lot of similarities to Nuragas. Professor Adam Sertal makes a link to the biblical story of Zizera and hypothesizes in him a leader of the Northern Sea peoples. The events in Judges 4 depict a conflict between the Canaanites under Zizera involving 900 iron chariots and the Israelite tribes under Barak and the prophetess Deborah. The name Sisera has similarities to the Sardinian city name Sassari. Zertal sees in the archaeological site El Ahwat the biblical place Haroshet. There and in close by sites he uncovered the Nuraga-like structures. Matching the biblical descriptions, he proposes there to have been the headquarter of Zizera and accordingly that under the collective term Canaanites, a Northern Sea People's Coalition is meant under Shardana dominance. Sertal says, I'm inclined to see the Battle of Deborah as a critical encounter between the Northern Israelite tribes and the Northern Sea Peoples, the Philistines being further south. If this reconstruction is correct, and the picture, of course, has many gaps and unanswered questions, then there must have been an organized coalition of Israelite tribes by the beginning of the 12th century before Christ. This is consistent with the view I have previously expressed, that by that time the tribes had already coalesced around the cultic center on Mount Ebal. Here again we see a kernel of historical events embedded in the early literary narratives of the Bible, a history that some scholarly community today would deny. Here ends our journey into the Nuraji culture, but only for the moment, because there is so much more to discover.